uh, we thank you for joining us for uh, this webinar entitled The Proto-Ecumenical Dialogue of Abba Mikael, Martin Luther, and Philip Melanchthon. Uh, my name is David Daniels. I'm a professor of church history at McCormick Theological Seminary in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, we're delighted to come to you today. Our co-sponsors are Georgetown University's Department of Theology and Religious Studies and its Berkeley Center for Peace, for Just for Religion, Peace and World Affairs. And this is being held in collaboration with the Ecclesiological Investigations International Research Network, the McCormick Theological Seminary, the Ecumenical Studies and Research uh, Center, um, Ecumenical Trends, and the Institute of Classical Christian Studies. Today, um, we, this is a chance for you um, within the last 15 minutes of our session to ask for, uh, have your own questions for Q&A. And so you'll see uh, the Q&A button on your screen. Please uh, click that and put your question in and we'll get to as many questions as, you, as we can. Um, we are, uh, this event will be posted on the event page of Georgetown University where many of you registered as well as on the YouTube channel uh, for Georgetown. We're excited that our um, lecturer and then the panels, panelists today um, will be with us from different parts of the world. And I will now uh, turn to um, introducing our presenter briefly. Uh, he's Dr. Stanislav Palau. He's the researcher at the History of Religions Department at the Leipzig Institute of uh, European History in Mainz, Germany. Um, we will now uh, turn to Dr. Palau. Thank you. Thank you very much, David, for this introduction and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today and I'm glad to be part of this event and I'm glad to share with you some findings on the, as I find, undeservably forgotten event that took place in 1534. An event that changed uh, away the fathers of Reformation, Martin Luther and Philip Melanchthon, thought about world Christianity. And I think that we have uh, a chance to engage in the discussion afterwards and to see how this event actually correspond to our reality today and what can we learn from this. But before I start, I would like to share with you a short story, a short story how I myself came across this proto-ecumenical dialogue between Abba Mikael and Martin Luther and Philip Melanchthon. Around eight years ago, I started to do research on entanglements between European Protestantism and Ethiopian Orthodox Christianity. And the first and obvious question was when the first interaction actually took place. And by doing research, I came across the commonplace that the first interaction took place actually in 1634, when a German from Lübeck called Peter Heiling arrived to Gondor, the capital of Ethiopia. And this idea of an European traveling to other parts of the world, discovering the other parts of the world, engaging in the dialogue was quite popular and can be found everywhere. But later on, doing research on Orthodox Protestant relations in a more general terms, I came across an odd publication. It was a publication of uh, Martin Luther's letters, an edition coming from the 1827. And in this German edition prepared by a professor Wilhelm de Wette, you can uh, see that there is a letter prepared by Martin Luther and given to a Greek clergyman but if you look into the text, you will find out that this clergyman is called Dominus Michael Ethiopis. And then I started to ask myself, is it a misspelling or misunderstanding? Why would be a clergy Greek clergyman be an Ethiopian? And doing research in this direction, looking for other edition, and at the end looking for manuscripts, I came across a whole branch uh, of uh, findings which changed some ideas about the history of early modern Christianity I had. And today I would like to share with you some of this. 
these findings I will present today are based on uh, my PhD, which will appear as a book in the coming month, and it will be also available freely uh, through open access. So if you might be interested in knowing more details, you can uh, go later and search online for this book. So let me start with showing the presentation outline. I will start by trying to reconstruct this encounter and showing the available uh, sources and questioning them. Then I would like to interpret the theological dimension of this dialogue. And finally, I would like uh, to reflect upon uh, the way how the first generation of Protestants remember this dialogue. So let's begin with the first part. I would like to introduce, first of all, sources that are available. And there are two sets of sources. The first set are sources from the year 1534 that narrate about this encounter. First of all, it is a letter of Melanchthon written to his friend Benedict Pauli on May 31, on the very day when the encounter took place. Then there is a letter of recommendation that was drafted by Philip Melanchthon and then signed by Luther, and it is dated by July 4th, the day when Abba Michael, the Ethiopian Orthodox monk, departed from Wittenberg. And there is also another letter from Melanchthon addressed to Martin Busser, informing him about the Ethiopian Christian who wish to go to Strasbourg and to encounter him there. And there is another set of sources. These are uh, the sources from the years 1537, 1538, uh, in which Luther and Melanchthon recollect this encounter. Those are table talks and a Luther sermon in which he speaks about Abba Michael. So first of all, let me start with the most uh, important uh, source in terms of understanding the setting of the encounter. Now we uh, have an autograph of Philip Melanchthon's letter to Benedict Pauli, where he explains uh, about an unexpected encounter uh, took place on the day of Trinity, May 31, 15, in the year 1534, when a stranger uh, approached Martin Luther and they engaged in a conversation about Trinity. And then they uh, came along and came to the conclusion that the Church of the East, as, the, as, as he writes, and uh, Luther share the same uh, idea of the Trinity. At the same time, Melanchthon says that this person is uneducated, meaning that he doesn't know Latin and Greek, and it was possible to communicate with him only in broken Italian. So the problem we have with the source that in this letter, the stranger is being described in with Latin term Arabs, whereas in other sources, he is being referred to as Ethiops. And some scholars have suggested that maybe those are two different strangers coming from an East Christian background to Wittenberg and encountering the Luther and engaging with him in a theological dialogue. However, one uh, can also uh, suggest that it might be the very same person because at that time, uh, in the first half of 16th century, at least in the German speaking uh, part of Europe, uh, in the Latin terms, Arabs and Ethiops were used as synonyms. Another hint that gives us uh, the letter that it might be actually the Ethiopian is the fact that he could speak broken Italian. And in fact, in the first half of 16th century in Rome, there was an Ethiopian Orthodox monastery, which was the center of the diasporic Ethiopian community, where Ethiopian Orthodox Christian across the Mediterranean uh, came as pilgrim or later also monk, monks and stayed for a while. And in the Library of Vatican, there is also a manuscript which used to belong to this monastery. And one particular manuscript from the first half of 16th century also has a note 
which says that the book belongs to a certain Michael, the Michael, as you can see here on the right part of this folio. So as we see, it, uh, there are several hints uh, that point out that it might be the very same person, an Ethiopian Orthodox monk coming with the help of diasporic uh, networks to Europe, first to Rome, learning their Italian, and probably having learned about the Reformation, uh, went to Wittenberg in order to encounter the Melanchthon and Luther. And now we'd like to highlight several elements of the theological dialogue that took place during these weeks in Wittenberg. All the sources we have speak in one voice that the two major themes discussed were the Trinity and the Eucharist. So on the one hand, there is anti-Trinitarian movement within the Reformation, uh, which is a challenge for uh, Martin Luther. And uh, the, there is a possibility to show that the teaching of the Ethiopian church, which is being seen as representative of the older tradition, is in accord with the teaching of the Wittenberg Reformation. On the other side, there is a huge debate on the nature of the Eucharist. Uh, and this debate is also uh, is directed uh, onto two sides. On the one hand, there is Roman Catholic theologians and the Re Roman Catholic position, uh, which uh, does not allow to distribute the Eucharist as uh, body and blood to the laity. And on the other side, there is a Zwinglian and Anabaptist position, which does not uh, proclaim the real presence uh, of Eucharist. And on both these topics, Martin Luther claims to have uh, allies on the side of Ethiopian Christians. But most importantly, those two topics culminated into, in the assumption that the Orthodox Christian and the Protestants actually belong to the one Church of Christ. And interestingly, the main uh, passage which proclaims this unity is uh, comes from the mouth of Abba Michael. In the letter of recommendation, which was given to him, Luther quotes him. And I read, even though the Eastern church observes some different religious ceremonies, he, Abba Michael, judges that this dissimilarity neither abolishes the unity of the church nor contradicts to the faith because the kingdom of Christ is spiritual righteousness of the heart fear of God and trust through Christ. And then he adds, we, means Luther and Manhattan, also approve this view. So this ecumenical vision was of importance for the self-understanding of the Wittenberg Reformation, because this idea of common belonging to the very same church with Orthodox Christians in distant parts of the world gave credibility to the articles of the creed declaring the unity and universality of the church, which otherwise would not be uh, experienced in the uh, daily life, having uh, theological debates uh, on the so many sides. At the same time, we have to see the dialogue as part of a larger discourse unfolding between Ethiopian and European forms of Christianity in the first half of the 16th century. So just to look at the very same year, 1534, and we'll see a wide range of events unfolding in uh, this regard. So there is a famous Portuguese uh, humanist and philosopher, Damião de Goes, who uh, discussed on the very same year, Ethiopian Christianity with the leading uh, figures of European reformation, traveling to Geneva, Basel, and Strasbourg, and also at the very same year in Lisbon, another Ethiopian Orthodox theologian, Sigeze Ab, uh, who uh, was an envoy of Ethiopian uh, emperor, Libna Dingel, he writes his book, The Ethiopian Moribus, in which he tried to present the teaching and the practice of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church for European uh, readership. So there is a, a, a wide range of activities taking place at the very same time. And 
I would argue that we have to also see the dialogue between Martin Luther, Philip and Abba Michael in this very particular context. Now I come to my third part of the presentation, uh, Ethiopian Christianity and the first generation of Protestants. This encounter and this unity was of high importance for the self-understanding of the Wittenberg Reformation. And we have repeatedly uh, instances of Luther and Melanchthon referring to this dialogue in the years 1537, 1538, I just will provide one example from the table talks. So Luther uh, says, three years ago, there was an Ethiopian uh, monk here, sorry, uh, where we had a discussion with him through an interpreter. He's, he summed up the articles of our faith by saying, this is a good creed. And we have another hint uh, showing that this encounter had a significance for the first generation of Protestants. And this is the wide dissemination of the letter of recommendation. We have at least nine uh, copies at our disposal, which is relatively high number. And I would like to point uh, at one particular manuscript, uh, which is now being kept uh, at the University Library of uh, Basel, where Abba Michael is being represented not as a deacon or monk, as usually it was the fact, but as a bishop. You can see on the title, Episcopo. And by that time in Europe, it was already known that within the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, there was only one single bishop. And this bishop was at the same time the head of the church. So this, this, this copy of the latest recommendation suggesting that Abba Michael was a bishop might also imply that Luther met not just a deacon or monk, but the head of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. But in the following centuries, this dialogue had been gradually erased from the Lutheran collective memory. In the beginning of my presentation, I referred to an old publication from the 19th century depicting the Ethiopian monk as a Greek clergyman. And it's part of phenomena uh, that at a certain point of time, starting from the 18th century, Apparently, the memory of an Ethiopian, an African theologian discussing with uh, Martin Luther and sharing with him the uh, assumptions about the unity did not uh, uh, cor uh, correlate to the uh, imagination of Luther and the confessional self of the understanding of the Lutheran church in the 18th and 19th century. So uh, gradually, Abba Michael disappeared. And it's only now that we have a chance by going back to the sources to rediscover this encounter. And I would like to finish my presentation by asking myself the question, why does this dialogue actually matters nowadays? First of all, I believe that this encounter changes our understanding of the Reformation's relation with the wider world. It was not only the starting point of the interaction between the Reformation and the multifaceted world of the Orthodox churches, but also the very first encounter of Protestantism with African and in general and non-European form of Christianity. Secondly, it opens new perspectives for Lutheran Orthodox or more general Protestant Orthodox dialogue. Since Luther perceived Abba Michael not merely as an Ethiopian Orthodox Christian, but rather as a representative of the Orientalist Ecclesia, the Eastern Church. He didn't distinguish between the multitude of different uh, churches existing in the Christian East with all the differences. Hence, this ecumenical proclamation of unity encompassed all the churches of the Christian East. And finally, I believe that this encounter challenges the perception of the early modern time as a period in which globalization of Christianity was driven exclusively by European actors and adds to our understanding of how new and connected forms of world building between Europe and Africa, as well as between Protestantism and Orthodoxy were negotiated. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Stanislav. Uh, we really appreciate um, the perspective that you have brought us. We really appreciate the perspective that you have brought us. 
and appreciate your opening up our conversation. Um, I now would like to begin to turn to the panelists. Um, our first panelist will be Dr. Timothy Winger, uh, Emeritus Professor of Church History at the United Theological Seminary in Philadelphia. Um, Dr. Sol he'll be followed by Dr. Solomon Bayene, who's a research fellow at the Job Ludoff Center for Ethiopian and Eritrean Studies. And then our third panelist will be the Reverend Dr. Dagmar Heller, the Acting Director of the Institute for Ecumenical Studies and Research. Um, let us now turn to uh, Dr. Timothy Winger. Um, thank you very much. Uh, it's been really interesting to listen to uh, your report. Um, um, first, a special thanks to Professor David Daniels for remembering me and dragging me out of retirement in the New Jersey Alps, as I call it, to make some comments on this important topic. I'm honored to be among such renowned scholars and to share something from my own expertise. Dr. Paulau is uh, to be congratulated for helping to recover this important encounter between Ethiopia and Wittenberg. Let me suggest a few new directions to strengthen this work. I would be remiss not to caution Dr. Paulau about his use of the term confessionalization of memory in the text of his remarks. Although it may sound helpful, it is a less than adequate way to describe how this early encounter became lost in later accounts. Reformation scholars have often made the mistake of equating Luther alone with Wittenberg's Reformation and theology. From the outset, however, it was a collaborative affair. So that Philip Melanchthon's contacts with the Orthodox in the 1540s should not be relegated to a different category, but were actually part of Wittenberg's overall approach. This is why Melanchthon wrote the letter of recommendation. And it also explains why the letters were associated with Melanchthon and in 1835 included in his correspondence already. But now for some suggestions. The first has to do with the 31st May 1534 letter that Melanchthon wrote to Benedict Pauli. Let us accept Dr. Paulo's argument that Melanchthon is referring to Abba Michael. The question I would raise is this, why did Melanchthon write a letter to Pauli who was also in Wittenberg? The more we know about Pauli, the clearer the answer becomes. Pauli was professor of law in Wittenberg, but by the 1530s, he was also an important counselor and legal advisor in Saxony. In 1532, and again in 1536, he was burgomaster of Wittenberg, and throughout the period, the chief legal counsel for the city. What Melanchthon's letter represents, I believe, is an answer to an official inquiry by Pauli as to the legitimacy of Abba Michael's presence in Wittenberg. Residence in a city in the Holy Roman Empire was a legal matter. And especially in a university town like Wittenberg, where there were often more students than citizens, foreigners could not simply show up without some documentation. This explains a lot. First, Melanchthon in the letter gently rebuked Pauli for being concerned about Abba Michael. Surely, he writes, there are other things to worry about in such dangerous times as these. But this may also explain Melanchthon's use of the term Arab, namely that he is simply citing a now lost letter of Pauli. Moreover, when he mentions Abba Michael's lack of a letter of commendation, Melanchthon is, I believe, directly responding to Pauli's legal concern. The mention of his difficulty with Italian, again, was directed more at Pauli, I believe, to help explain why Pauli himself or one of his agents had such difficulties understanding Abba Michael. Melanchthon's aside about Abba Michael's conversation with Luther about the agreement on the Trinity between Eastern and Western churches may point to yet another misapprehension of Pauli, that the Ethiopian was another, yet another carrier of anti-Trinitarian ideas, like Johann Campanus, who had shown up in Wittenberg in 1530. 
A related problem in Wittenberg was adequate housing. So that the mention by Melanchthon in that letter of Abba Michael's lodgings with the innkeeper Valentin Eberhardt was also important. We also discover that Abba Michael was not a beggar, another worry of the city fathers. Habit viaticum, Melanchthon writes, that is, he has traveling money. Melanchthon's comment that he would be leaving the next day, I believe was more for Pauli's consumption than anything. An interpretation underscored by Melanchthon's use of the term in that sentence, I am hearing. In other words, rumor has it that anything to allay Pauli's unfounded, frankly, legalistic fears. The most important line comes next. It seems to me that he is a homo ingeniosus. This delightfully Ciceronian term means a person of superior intellect or of good natural talents. Melanchthon loved to use uh, this term in letters of recommendation or as in this case, a letter defending an Ethiopian's priest's right to be in Wittenberg. Now at this point, because of the language barrier, Melanchthon was not yet quite sure what Abba Michael had to offer, but he had invited him to supper, where I believe his opinion of him changed, as was reflected in the July letter of recommendation. In any case, the last sentence would also not have been lost on Pauli, where Melanchthon contrasts this visitor to other Arabs, again using Pauli's term, I believe, who were all unlearned and ignorant of academic languages, namely Greek and Latin. The very last line I would argue cinches my argument. I reckon that the body politic will not be endangered by him. That was Pauli's greatest worry as a city's lawyer. Now, if this characterization of Melanchthon's first letter about Abba Michael is accurate, then the other two letters demonstrate a remarkable change in attitude based upon Melanchthon's one-on-one -on -one conversations. Uh, Melanchthon's uh, Brief Exile 1459 is a personal letter to Bootser that Abba Michael would also have been carrying with him to Strasbourg, I think he went to Strasbourg, and dated for July 1534. Bootser, who by this time was becoming a close colleague of Melanchthon, as they negotiated rapprochement between the Southern German cities and Wittenberg on the Lord's Supper that led to the 1535 Wittenberg Concord, could not have read the letter of recommendation itself in any other way than very positive, given what it is that um, uh, uh, Melanchthon writes in the private letter. Moreover, that letter began with an insistence on the importance of conversations with those of various nations. By this time, Melanchthon had had many conversations, I believe, on varying topics with Abba Michael, and he encourages Bootser to do the same. The final letter in this small snapshot into Ethiopian Orthodox Lutheran relations is, of course, the letter of recommendation itself, written by uh, Melanchthon. It addresses three areas, not just two, with comments on the Lord's Supper, perhaps most important is this letter's paraphrase of a line from Irenaeus. Diversity in fasting does not dissolve unity in faith, which Melanchthon had already cited in the Augsburg Confession, Article 26. This notion that rights do not have to be the same is critical to inner uh, Protestant negotiations of the time, to the rejection of Roman opponents who argued that changing rights divided the church and to the acceptance of Eastern rights with which at least Melanchthon was by this time familiar in, uh, by 1531. Another line is particularly enlightening because it shows that the reformers were learning from Abba Michael rather than the other way around. Thus Melanchthon states, perhaps for Bootser's benefit, quote, we also learned from him that the right that we observe in the practice of the Lord's Supper and the Mass in Wittenberg agrees with the Eastern Church. This means that Abba Michael, having observed the Eucharistic liturgy in Wittenberg, would have declared it in agreement with his own. The absence of private Masses in both churches 
meant for the reformers that the mass was not being celebrated there on behalf of the dead and therefore not effective ex opere operato, that is by the mere performance of the rite, etc. On the question of the Trinity, it is important to note that the phrase filioque, uh, the proceeding of the Holy Spirit from the Father and the Son, appears nowhere in the 100 plus volumes of Luther's works. Moreover, it is nowhere to be found in Melanchthon's lectures on the Lotzi Communes of 1533-34, or in the second edition of this work, Summarizing Christian Doctrine, published in 1535. This was not the Wittenbergers' concern. Thus, conversations on the Trinity would rather have touched upon other things, the full divinity of the Son and the full divinity of the Holy Spirit in reaction to the actual attacks on Trinitarian theology by the likes of Campanus and Servetus. Finally, the reformers were centrally concerned for the question of salvation. Here too, it would seem that Abba Michael would seem to agree with them, with them, yes. Moreover, in the later reminiscence from the 1537 table talk to which you referred, Luther quotes Abba Michael using Italian. Let me, in my translation now, three years ago, there was an Ethiopian monk here with us with whom we conversed through an interpreter. He, and he having concluded from all our articles, said, this is a bona creda. That's Italian, bona creda, it's not Latin, certainly not good Latin. That is a good faith. And the hoc est that, that is, is there precisely to translate the word creda. That is a good faith. Here too, um, Abba Michael is described providing information and approval, not the other way around, so that Wittenberg could use this encounter as a way of substantiating their own teaching within the church Catholic, especially important as the final break with Rome seemed in 1534 all but inevitable. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Winger. We now turn to Dr. Bayene. First, I would like to thank uh, the speaker, uh, Stanislaw Paula, for his great contribution to the neglected subject uh, in the Ethiopian historiography. Officer Temu Gamba Mikhail, who met Luther at Wittenberg in 1534. The article deals with the encounter between the monk and Luther and the religious discussion based on the letter of recommendation that Luther wrote in the same year and other relevant primary sources. According to the sources, we have learned that this Ethiopian monk, Michael, took the initiatives to meet Luther and had a conversation with him. What were the factors that led him to meet Luther? Was there a case similar to Michael on Ethiopian side to discuss religious doctrine among Latin Europe? This would help us to see things in broader perspective. First of all, it's important to examine Paula's exhaustive work, which I have read and I will try to reflect on it. Except Paula's well-articulated analysis we have no certainty from where Michael traveled to Wittenberg in 1534. Paula relied on a single piece of information in Luther's letter of recommendation, which mentions that once Michael was confirmed to meet Luther, the problem was in what language they could communicate since Michael was not able to speak either of the two major languages Greek and Latin of international communication among the scholar of that day. But Michael spoke only a broken Italian language and he converses with Luther with, Luther, with the help of an interpreter. It can therefore be assumed that he spent a long time in an Italian speaking environment. Paula further asserts that Michael most likely he belonged to the Ethiopian monastic community Rome in Rome 
as the Church of Santo Stefano Dili Avicini, which had served as the main meeting place and guest house for Ethiopian pilgrims from the 1480s onwards, developed into an important center of Ethiopian Orthodox intellectual life and also received the formal status of an Ethiopian Orthodox monastic community in 1550. But his hypothesis is only further supported by the fact that the name Michael is attested in the manuscript of Bibliotica Apostolica Vaticana, which formerly belonged to the Ethiopian Orthodox Monastery in Rome, where Michael's name is mentioned as owner, who for me still not perfectly referred to Abba Michael as could be another Michael. But after meeting Luther, we did not know whether he had returned to his monastery or not. In other place, it's reported that after having met Luther, Michael intended to travel to Strasbourg to meet another reformer, Martin Busa. However, it's not known whether this plan were realized or not. On the other hand, we don't know whether Michael stayed, stayed in contact with Luther or another reformer after the meeting with Luther, which is not dealt with in the article. It seems that Luther was not sure where Michael was either. This is apparent from the conversation he had with his colleague, Melaton, about faith. Three years ago, there was an Ethiopian monk with us with whom we had a discussion through an interpreter. He summed up all our article of faith by saying, this is good credo, that is faith. Similarly, in other of uh, the table talk about private mass, again, between the two big reformers, there was an interesting information that Michael knew about the Christian religious practices in Asia, where he might have been there for a while. The conversation states that the private mass deceived many saints from the time of Rigori for over 800 years. Even Johus was still captive to this superstition. I'm amazed, said Luther. How God rested me from this singular idolatry. Philip mentioned responded there was a certain Ethiopian who was here in Wittenberg three years ago. He affirmed that in Asia there was no instance of private mass, but only the public mass. But we have no information where exactly the place was in Asia. So who was this Ethiopian monk who knew about Asian Christianity would also be essential information. Did Michael return to the monastery of Santo Stefano Dili Avicini in Rome, as Paula had certainly suggested? Did he return to Ethiopia, or did, he, or did he die somewhere on his way to Ethiopia? All these fundamental historical questions must be answered and studied in order to understand the whole history of the encounter. I do not intend to argue here about the theological issues that were discussed between Michael and Luther, which is not my field at all, and I will leave that part to the scholar in the field. But I will try to reflect on some historical elements, and then I will highlight some facts and points that Paula has argued. It would have been good if we had known more about Michael first. It was not clear whether he was sent by the Ethiopian kings or how he traveled there. But Paula referred him as the first sign of encounter from the Ethiopian side, and perhaps he could be the bishop of Ethiopia. This could only be justified if one considers the history of Ethiopia as a, as a time in 1534. As far as we know, Ethiopian emperor had various diplomatic contacts from the 14th century onwards, which is dealt with, with in several scholarly works. 
Ethiopian ecclesiastical groups also frequently visited Jerusalem, Rome, and other centers, but most of them did not return to Ethiopia. In any case, on Ethiopian side, there was no interest in religious diplomatic relation. But when Christian kingdom fell into turbulent civil war between the Christians and the Muslims led by Imam Ahmed starting from 1527, continued to 1543, King Libladingen requested a military support from the Latin Europe. We know for sure the man who sent by King Zareab, by the King Zagaza, who did not come back to Ethiopia, to the Christian kingdom of Ethiopia. So I am not certain, but need to carry out more rigorous research on the biography of Mikhail. I do, I do argue that most probably could be the lost Sagaza, except the two monks maintain two different names. They share similar character, the same experience. Both of them, European culture, spoke Italian, lived in the same time in Europe, so Mikhail could it be Zara Sagazab uh, or an independent person. Who was Sagazab? He was an Ethiopian Orthodox monk, served as Libladingle as a missionary in Portuguese affairs from 1520 to 1526. Then he traveled to Portugal in 1526 together with Alvarez's mission. He was in the court of Portugal from 1527 to 1533, suffering the scorn of court theologian and being denied communion. And then he decided to alter the phase of uh, Ethiopian, which was first published in 1540. He also took established friendship or religious discussion with Goys who corresponded with several personalities in Lutheran camp, seemed reluctant to accept papal communication of the reformer. In this case, Sagazab was also well informed of the Lutheran reformation. We do not have sources where, where was Sagazab from 1534 on, on except we know for sure that he died on the way to Ethiopia in 1539. Finally, as I have attempt to reflect on the matter, the history of Abba Mikhail is still obscure that require more further rigorous research. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Yenik. We now turn to Dr. Heller. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to say that I read Stanislaw Paulo's paper with great interest and great joy. I think it is a marvelous piece which sheds new light on the Protestant Orthodox relations in the time of the Reformation, but which gives us also some insight in early ecumenical thinking. So the perspective in which I read the paper is twofold. A. What does this tell us about Orthodox Protestant relationship? And B, what does it tell us about ecumenism or ecumenical thinking in general? In other words, can we find here some helpful guiding principles for ecumenical dialogue? The answer to question A is rather easy. And I think Stanislaw Paulau gave it already himself. Obviously, contacts between Protestants and Orthodox began already earlier than we thought so far. And also, obviously contacts of the reformers with Oriental Orthodox are earlier than with Eastern Orthodox, or at least they did not start later than those with Eastern Orthodox. The answer to my second question B is more difficult. Therefore, let me try a somewhat deeper analysis of Luther's recommendation letter. First of all, I'm interested in the themes for discussion. As Stanislaw Paolo has found, 
it seems that the two topics of discussion were the Trinity and the Eucharist or Holy Supper. At least this is what is mentioned in the letter of recommendation which Luther wrote for this Ethiopian deacon. This raises the following questions for me. Why these two questions? Paolo suggests that the first theme, namely the Trinity, might have been chosen because of the fact, I quote, that according to the Western Christian liturgical calendar, the Trinity Sunday was celebrated on this day, the day of the first encounter. And therefore, I quote again, immediately before meeting the Ethiopian monk, Luther had given a sermon in the castle church of Wittenberg on the Trinity, end quote. And the other reason might have been, according to Paolo, that Luther in the early 1530s was confronted with the question of the scriptural conformity of the doctrine of the Trinity. Likewise, Paolo sees a reason for the choice of the second subject of the discussion, the Eucharist, in the fact that, I quote, just before the meeting with the Ethiopian monk, he, Luther, wrote a commentary on his own treatise von der Winkelmesse und der Pfaffenweihe published the year before. Therefore, he polemicized sharply both against the papist, papists whose theology of the mass sacrifice and private masses he vehemently rejected and against enemies of sacraments within the Reformation camp who denied the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist." End of the quote. In other words, these two themes were issues, according to Paolo, with which Luther was occupied during that time. This might, of course, be the case, and I'm sure that Luther's preoccupations influenced the discussion. But in my mind, this is still not quite a satisfying answer to the question why they chose these two themes. Since Obviously, Abba Michael had come to see Luther on his own initiative, not on Luther's initiative. And therefore, one could presume that he, I mean Michael, had some questions to ask Luther, which he wanted to discuss with Luther. Therefore, the question is, what are the points Abba Michael wanted to discuss with Luther? Of course, to answer, this uh, to answer this question is difficult with the few sources we have, but it seems to me we get some hints from the letter of recommendation. First of all, in what Luther writes in this letter, he puts the focus on the two themes which we just mentioned, which are interesting in his Luther's context, namely the Trinity and the Eucharist. And it seems to be natural to do this because he wants to recommend the person to other reformers. So he needs to point out the agreement of this person with opinions of the reformers. If you want to find out about more themes that might have been discussed, we might have to read between the lines. And I try to do this from two perspectives. First, from Luther's perspective, namely what is Luther's interest in the discussion? And second, from Abba Mikhail's perspective, what is Mikhail's interest in the discussion? First, from Luther's perspective. In short, Luther seems to be interested in two things. On the one hand, he seems to put Father Mikhail to a test, whether he is in agreement with Luther's point of view in order to find out whether Michael is on his side or on the side of the others. Therefore, he writes, I quote, we heard him rightly agree with the creed that the Western church holds, nor does he think about the Trinity any differently than what the Western church thinks, end of the quote. Thus, the thinking of the Western church is the criterion. And the same we can see for the question of the Eucharist. Luther writes, I quote, 
For although the Eastern Church observes some divergent ceremonies, he, he, namely the monk, judges that this difference does not undermine the unity of the church nor conflict with faith because the kingdom of Christ is spiritual righteousness of heart, fear of God and trust through Christ. We too approve of this opinion." End of the quote. Again, the criterion for recommending this person is Luther's opinion. And on the other hand, Luther goes a step further and tries to test out Lutheran thinking, whether it is in agreement with other churches than the Roman church. This gives him an argument against his opponents in Rome. Quote, we also learn from him, Luther writes, that the rite which we observe at the Lord's Supper and the Mass is in accord with the Eastern Church. Here, it is not the question whether the Ethiopian rite is in accordance with the Lutheran rite, but the other way around. It seems Luther wants to show with this observation that the Reformation is right as opposed to the Roman Catholic way of celebrating the Lord's Supper. Thus, it seems that the ecumenical encounter here is shaped by the specific context, if not to say by certain interests. In short words, it seems to me that Luther is interested in this encounter with Father Michael because this person is in consensus with Luther's idea, ideas. And therefore, Luther can, quote, use him to a certain extent in his critique of the Catholic Church. But now to the second perspective. What is Father Michael's perspective? From the letter of recommendation, I think we can also find something about the interest of the Ethiopian deacon in this discussion. I come back to the sentence, I quote, for although the Eastern Church observes some divergent ceremonies, he judges, he is the, the, the Ethiopian monk, he judges that this difference does not undermine the unity of the church nor conflict, nor conflict with faith because the kingdom of Christ is a spiritual righteousness of heart, fear of God and trust through Christ. We too approve of this opinion. This um, formulation is uh, put in a way that it first mentions the opinion of Father Michael to which Luther agrees. This is slightly different for the other points where Luther's position is the point to which the other agreed. Therefore, this seems to suggest an interest on the Ethiopian side in the question of unity. And it seems also to suggest a certain openness to diversity. Obviously, Father Michael wanted to know from Luther something about the Lutheran mass and finds that there is a court. It seems that the question of unity is the question coming from the Ethiopian side. So we have here probably even a third theme, which was a subject of discussion in Luther's and Father Michael's encounter, unity or Christian unity. From this observation, we can get to two important, I would call it inputs, from this event for ecumenism today. First, first I, uh, my, my first point here is related to the habit or to the attitude with which Father Michael comes to this encounter. It is unknown, of course, whether Father Michael really came from Rome, as Paolo suggests, but in any case, he must have heard from somewhere about Martin Luther. If he had heard about Luther in Rome, I suppose it was rather negative what he had heard. The more, what, however it was, but I think the more it has to be praised that he takes the opportunity to get his own image of the reformers by a personal visit. And it, this seems to me a very important basis for ecumenism in general, namely, not to follow cliches which others tell you, but to make up your own mind in your own 
with an own in, in, in an own in, a personal encounter. And the second um, input I get from this um, encounter is the question of unity as such. Again, we do not know exactly what the two discuss the two persons discussed here, but from our source we see that they agree on a very important principle. Difference in ceremonies does not undermine unity. But it is, it is not only this principle. Unity is for both, for Luther and for Father Michael, an inner quality, as Luther writes, because the kingdom of Christ is spiritual righteousness of heart, fear of God and trust through Christ. What this exactly means is a question which needs further exploration. But it seems to me that there is already in Nutze something similar to the idea of spiritual ecumenism. So far, my observations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank all three of the panelists, Dr. Heller, Dr. Vindene, and uh, Dr. Winger. Now I'll turn to Dr. Palau for any responses you'd like to give to the panelists um, before we open up for the Q&A. First of all, thank you very much for your insights. I'm really impressed by all these rich perspectives which we have, and I think it shows that this field of inquiry is just at the very beginning. We have at this moment a huge corpus of excellent literature dealing with the encounters of Ethiopian Christianity with Roman Catholic uh, Church at the early modern period, but we have almost no uh, knowledge about the encounters between Protestantism and Ethiopian Christianity. And I think this conversation uh, shows very well that there are a number of perspectives which have to be taken in order to get a clear picture. What I am um, on my side can uh, suggest for the following uh, uh, research perspectives are two points. On the one side, speaking about uh, theological dialogues, at this period of time, I think we have to keep in mind two points. The first point is that in the early 16th century, all parties try to appropriate Ethiopian Christianity. We have a number of publications on the Roman Catholic side, which try to quote uh, uh, certain uh, passages, for example, from the book from Tzigeza Ab, in order to uh, articulate their views and to show that Ethiopian Christianity is in accord with Roman Catholic uh, teaching and not with the Protestant one. We have on the other side, on the other side, also a number of Protestant uh, writings referring to the Ethiopian church. For example, also Martin Busser in his later writings refer to the Ethiopian church and also try to show it as being in accord with Protestant teaching. So those appropriation of Ethiopian Christianity have to be seen uh, very carefully in this context of inner European theological polemics. And we should be, I think, be also aware of uh, these attempts uh, to describe Ethiopian Christianity as uh, uh, something which is in accord with the author's opinion. On the other uh, hand, and, uh, we have a phenomenon, I think, that can be called uh, Ethiopian cosmopolitanism in the early 16th century. We know uh, about a number of Ethiopians uh, that traveled to Europe and, that, uh, and who were able to move along the confessional borders of the time, who could uh, make a career within the Catholic Church uh, at the, and uh, be in a, a, a great relations uh, with uh, hierarchs of the uh, Catholic Church and being also seeing themselves as being Orthodox. So I think there is a certain phenomenon of how theology and theological controversies were perceived from the Ethiopian Orthodox side. In this uh, particular case, uh, I also think uh, about uh, the writing of Tzige Zahab, who explicitly write in his book that he didn't come to Europe in order to engage himself into discussions and polemics, but in order to create friendship and peace. So there might be something uh, about the way how theology and how dialogue 
was uh, seen by different sides. And I think this is a point that has to be investigated uh, further. Thank you, that's all my side. Th thank you so much. Um, I, I will now turn to the questions from the Q&A and again, want to uh, show appreciation for our panelists and as well as our speaker. Um, so, so one of the questions that have now uh, come up is about um, where might he have been from? And clearly there's not um, a lot of information, um, but, but if you could maybe just say a little bit, one is your proposal that he's from Rome. There is another possibility that he's from the Ethiopian community in Cyprus. Um, Johannes Baptiste, who eventually becomes a, a Roman Catholic bishop, uh, who is the bishop to the Ethiopian community in Cyprus. He also served as the papal nuncio to the Orthodox world, not just Ethiopians, but to the whole Orthodox community. Uh, has a brother named Mikael who is uh, within the, the dossier um, for Johannes Baptiste is listed as a deacon. Um, and then of course, um, we heard from Dr. Bayene, um, the possibility maybe he's somehow related either to um, Zaga, Zaga Zaab or from somebody within that community that's there. Can, can you say just a little bit about um, how we might begin to think about that? And then maybe even why it might be important or not important to know where he's from. Yeah, it's an excellent question. And I would be very careful about stating where he's coming from, because as far as we know about Ethiopians traveling uh, around the Mediterranean, many of them were going from one place to another and not being bound to a certain locality. So my idea that he might have some connection to the community in Rome was based uh, upon two main assumptions. First of all, the community in Rome was central for the whole diasporic network of Ethiopian uh, across the Mediterranean. So it is most probably that he could have certain connection to this community. We don't know what kind of connection it was. And secondly, as you also mentioned, uh, all we know about his background is that he could speak some Italian. So evidently he should have spent certain time in an Italian speaking environment. And uh, the last point I, I proposed in this connection is uh, the fact that there is indeed a, a manuscript from uh, the early 16th century from the library of this monastery mentioning a certain Michael. So if we also take in account that in the early 16th century, the Ethiopian Orthodox uh, convent did not have a large number of monks. As far as I know, uh, it is estimated that it were around 20 uh, monks at the time. So having quite small group of people living there and having a manuscript belonging to a Michael, it does not mean it has to be this certain Michael, but it might be another hint that could suggest that this connection was there. But actually, we are on the ground of building hypotheses. And I think if we are lucky and we are doing more research in this direction, because as I said, it's, it's all pioneering uh, uh, research. And I, I'm sure further research also in the Vatican Library might give uh, further hints and further direction uh, to understand better how actually it was possible for an Ethiopian monk to go so far to the north, because all we know at the moment about Ethiopian uh, pilgrims and uh, travelers, we know mostly from the context of the Mediterranean. But as far as I'm aware, we don't know much about other Ethiopians traveling so far uh, beyond uh, the Alps. And I think all these issues are now uh, there and uh, there is a lot of work to be done. I appreciate that. Um, so first of all, I'd like to let you know that in the Q&A, a number of the people are offering you thanks for the paper uh, and to the panelists, thanks for the discussion. So I won't mention everyone who does that, but I do want you to know that. Um, so one question is asking for this larger uh, world with Arabic speaking people. So the question goes this way, um, are there any sources hinting to encounters between Luther and other reformers and representatives from Arab speaking churches from Egypt or Syria uh, or other places? 
I'm not aware of any. And I think also why does Ethiopia play such a big role? From our perspective nowadays, it might seem surprising, but actually at the, uh, during the early 16th century, the establishment of relation between Portugal and Ethiopia became a huge uh, uh, sensation. And it was also a huge uh, uh, media, uh, uh, it became a, a very important uh, event. And we have a number uh, of publication dealing with this. Therefore, uh, it's also not surprising that the reformers who try to refer to the Eastern church, they refer to Ethiopia because the Greek speaking churches uh, after the fall of Constantinople became uh, under the rule of, uh, East, of the, under Muslim rule. And as Luther in one of his table talks uh, it's being quoted that he says in Asia Minor, there are almost no Christians and the most Christians living now in uh, India and uh, further regions. So I think the very idea, the very idea how, how Orthodox churches were perceived by the reformers is very different from how we used to think about the world of orthodoxy. And at that uh, time, I think Ethiopia was indeed the, the very prominent example of an orthodox Christian country, whereas other traditional orthodox regions, which became, uh, became uh, not uh, more independent, uh, were not perceived as the primary uh, dialogue partner. But as uh, I said, I have, uh, haven't come across any reference to the context of the Arab speaking Christians. Appreciate that. Um, the next question goes with this Catholic Protestant comparison uh, and how Protestants might have related, uh, the, the Protestants that did, reformers of this time, perceived and related to the Church of Ethiopia, uh, Church of Ethiopia, and then how Catholics. So the question goes this way. Um, this dialogue coincides with the time period when the Catholic Church sought unity with the Ethiopian Church, often through forced uh, political means. To what extent uh, can we call these Protestant Orthodox fraternal relations a product of, a com of their common anti-Catholic sentiment? And they end with this way, is the enemy of their enemy a friend? Thank you very much. It's uh, also a very good question. And I think you, de you, you describe the phenomenon we will have in the 17th century, because during the early part of the 16th century, the Catholic Church used uh, to have quite fraternal relationship with the Ethiopian Orthodox Church as the very fact of existence of Ethiopian Orthodox monastery in Rome, actually in Vatican itself, suggests it became only uh, at later part, uh, I, I guess starting from the 1540s, 1550s, when the Catholic Church changed the attitude towards Ethiopian Orthodoxy and started force on the conversion, which also led to the fact that the Ethiopian Orthodox monastery in Rome uh, did not exist anymore as an Orthodox community, but had uh, to become a Catholic one. And uh, the animosity between the Roman Catholic Church and Ethiopian Orthodox, I think also is under, uh, is also part of the so-called uh, anti-reformation movement. I think it was the reformation itself that make the question of doctrines so important that the Catholic Church had to take a stance also in it against the teachings of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church more uh, severely. And the very question I think I think you also have to keep in mind that at this point of time, we have a uh, exchange of letters uh, between the Ethiopian rulers and uh, papacy uh, regarding the unity of the church also and regarding the status of the Pope. And also the, the, the rules of Ethiopian church often show themselves open to accept Pope to a certain degree as a leading figure without however uh, suggesting what consequences it might have for the Ethiopian church. Appreciate that. Um, this next question goes with this question of um, how one understands the communication because of the fact that they didn't both speak Latin um, or their, they, the Germans didn't speak uh, Gaze. Um, so the question goes this way. How do you assess Abba Mikhail's poor ability 
communicate in Italian in the context of these questions. It strikes me that Luther makes very strong claims about the agreement between them, despite his interlocutor's inability to express himself with precision. Does this imply that Luther generally presumes unity until this until the similarity slash disunion is demonstrated? Do you see Luther's approach here as generally consistent with the way he engages with other less educated interlocutors or with other interlocutors with whom he couldn't communicate due to a language barrier? Um, I, I'd like you to start, but I'd like to also turn to anyone on the panel um, to also maybe um, talk about how Luther dealt with the lesser educated interlocutors. But, but first you, Dr. Palau. I think it's an excellent example of a collaborative effort in a way. I think it is. Uh, it was great that Wittenberg was a university city, that Menachton and Luther were able to engage someone uh, who was able to speak Italian and who was able to be an interpreter in this context. My point was just to suggest that we have to be very careful taking for granted what Luther suggests about Michael told him, because I'm sure we have to read these assumptions in the context of inner European polemics and debates. And Luther certainly has huge interest in uh, pointing out at those uh, elements that fit to his current agenda within this debate. Uh, let me add a few things if it's uh, possible. And, yes, please do. Um, the, the first is simply to reiterate that this uh, theology in Wittenberg in 1534 was done collaboratively. So uh, uh, for one thing, Dr. Heller, you must not refer uh, continuously to Martin Luther. It was Philip Melanchthon who wrote this letter and actually we have uh, then three sources from Melanchthon. And in the case of Philip Melanchthon, of course, uh, uh, he is very interested in the church fathers, in the Eastern fathers, uh, and, and therefore also in Eastern theology. He has read the, um, the various uh, liturgies by this time. Uh, so he's, he has a very broad interest in these questions. And as I've just argued, uh, his, his letter to Benedict Pauli really shows that at that point, May 31st, he has not really met this man yet. Um, and I think that the, the letter of recommendation shows how much more impressed he is with his ability to communicate. Uh, the fact that then Luther in this table talk reference quotes Abba Michael speaking Italian, uh, that bona creda uh, is, is to me just a, a wonderful example of, uh, I think that uh, most likely uh, Abba Michael spoke better Italian uh, than Melanchthon realized in that first letter because he hadn't talked to him yet. Now they had to use a, a, a student, uh, Melanchthon says, as a, as a translator, someone who knew uh, Italian. But of course, it, let's not forget, you know, Martin Luther actually walked down to uh, Rome uh, from Erfurt and back again uh, earlier on. So the fact that somebody could walk up to, uh, to Wittenberg was not at all impossible. There were very good uh, ties. And also let's not forget that in, in, in Venice, which didn't really want to have anything to do with Rome, uh, uh, that in Venice, you have a lot of contacts at this point. Uh, and in the 1540s, then actually a letter from Venetian Christians to Luther, uh, um, asking more about the Reformation. And so we don't have a closed community, particularly in 1534. I mean, uh, it always depends on who the Pope is, but uh, Paul III, you see, is just taking over at this point. We have the first call for a council uh, coming out in, a, in another year. Um, in this period, there really is a lot of flux and there certainly was among these uh, uh, ethnic communities in Rome, a certain amount of freedom. Uh, they want to find out for themselves uh, what uh, Luther teaches or what, uh, better spoken, uh, what Wittenberg theology is all about. And so the fact that they send someone, I think that's really what's going on, that the, the community itself uh, sends Abba Michael to find out uh, what's going on in Wittenberg. And therefore, uh, particularly on the mass, he comes back with his opinion about the uh, the mass, 
And his opinion, I think, probably about some sort of um, summary of the Augsburg Confession, that is, of, of justification itself. Uh, that's what that word spiritual means. Um, and uh, all of these things that I think uh, contribute to the what I have now from Paulo's paper is this very high regard for this Ethiopian and his interest in finding out what the Wittenbergers think. And so the question is not so much what Luther's agenda is. It isn't his agenda. This person shows up, um, except in the problem is, and this is for Melanchthon very important, the problem is these heretics on the Trinity, I think, in the first case. And in the second case on the Lord's Supper, it is to show to Bootser that what they're doing in Wittenberg, which was still a very high mass with bells and all kinds of things, was actually now uh, uh, approved by this Ethiopian. So it seems to me that's the context for this. I, I do want to add that um, um, Dr. Palau does follow uh, Martin Brech in seeing the letter to Benedict Pauli and the July 4th letter as being the same. I think the Swedish scholar Thomas Hart, uh, and then also a person by the name of David Daniels, thinks that there are two different letters because they think they're two different people. And so therefore, if Thomas Hart and I am correct, then this issue of the person not speaking Italian well is not an issue. Uh, and, 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 and the other thing that Thomas Hart does is that Thomas Hart also sees one of the table talks where the discussion was beyond what was in this letter. It was a broader discussion that discussed the creed as Dr. Wingard is saying, and therefore it's not merely the Trinity and Eucharist, but it was the, the, the Wittenberg articles altogether. And if Thomas Hart and David Daniels are correct on this, then it really was possibly a higher level conversation than you would have had with a lesser educated person. But, but I think that's where the debate is. But I will say Dr. Palau is on the side of the famous German scholar, uh, Martin Brech. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so, so, so I appreciate that. So the next question um, is going back to where uh, Dr. Benanier uh, was um, with um, Zaga Zahab. Um, so it, it, it goes this way. How did uh, Abba Mikael and also uh, Zaga Zahab uh, finance um, their travel to Europe? Um, were they sent by the Ethiopian kings or emperors, uh, maybe as envoys? Uh, if so, um, which uh, were the kings aware of the Protestant religion at this time, obviously, or as exiles um, to get rid um, of their heretic or heretical thought? So one question is on finance. The other question is on awareness about Protestantism um, within Ethiopia at this time. And the third one, if there are exiles um, because of, of maybe following um, Stephanos uh, or one of the heret um, theoretical sort of almost Pauline perspectives of the previous century, uh, could that be there? So it's sort of three questions is there. So indeed, uh, those two figures, Abba Mikael and Segeza Ab, are prominent for our understanding of the time, but we have to keep in mind that they evidently have very different position within the church, first of all, and within uh, the diplomatic relationship. So Sigiza Ab had a very high position within the church. He was Likaka Henat, so to say the, the high priest, if you want to translate it uh, in the direct way. And he was indeed an envoy of Ethiopian Emperor Libnadingo to the Portuguese uh, court. And he had, a, first of all, a diplomatic mission. And he, being in Lisbon, was so much uh, upset by the fact that the, the court theologians, who were Catholic theologians, who were educated in Paris, and at that time already engaging in the confession discussion, re rejecting him from the Eucharist, rejecting him from the church communion, he uh, had to write down his uh, work in which he tried to explain uh, the Ethiopian Orthodox teaching. So that's on the one side. Uh, Zahab as an official representative being, of course, sponsored by the uh, Ethiopian emperor. What concerns Abba Mikael, all we know is uh, the short reference in the letter of Melanchthon to Benedict Pauli that Abba Mikael has his travel money, so he doesn't require any financial uh, uh, help. We have, at this point of time, not enough information to have other 
uh, hints on what uh, his financial background might be, but we know that he was a deacon. He is being referred either to uh, as deaconus or monachus. So he was monk and a deacon most probably, and consequently he had not uh, the same position within the hierarchy of the Ethiopian church as Tigeza had. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, this next question is, is around placing this with both within the Orthodox community at the time and within the dialogue that comes later, um, a few decades later. So um, this question is, uh, it, would be interest, it would be very interesting to place this first dialogue um, with Ethiopian Orthodox in the context of the later dialogue or correspondence between Constantinople and the early Protestant reformers. Um, they reached out to the Orthodox for the reasons mentioned by Professor Winger, but such an early dialogue, 1534, can still be a wonderful motivation for present generations to continue the dialogue between the churches. Um, can, can you say something about that? And then a related question um, is the fact that the Ethiopian church was not in communion with Constantinople. And so how do we understand that within the context of a Protestant Ethiopian dialogue of the 16th century? Thank you for this question. And uh, let me start with the uh, last question uh, about did the Ethiopians uh, already know something about Protestantism? I think it relates also to the following question about the dialogues. The earliest Ethiopian text uh, I could uh, find, which referred to Martin Luther, uh, is quite recent. It originates in the early 20th century, at the time when, when Protestantism became very influential uh, on the Horn of Africa. And this text actually is also a way of debate he says that people who do, do not confess that the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist are heretics and their father is Luther. And I think it's very significant to see these two points. We have the first encounter, Abba Michael and Luther confessing the same understanding of Eucharist in 16th century. And then we have the first uh, Ethiopian Orthodox text referring to Martin Luther as father of Protestants in the context that those are heretics who do not confess the real presence of Christ in the early 20th century. So I think it's important to, to keep in mind those different uh, divergent perspectives. And it also had a direct impact on the uh, dialogue as uh, what concerns the dialogue with the Church of Constantinople. Uh, we have already a different set of questions on the table. And consequently, uh, we have a totally uh, uh, different uh, perception of each other. On the one side, uh, the uh, Wittenberg Reformation uh, is already at another stage of confession building, let us say, and uh, self-awareness. And on the other hand, uh, we have uh, uh, more uh, nuanced uh, theological treaties which are being dealt with. It's not an oral conversation, but we have uh, uh, here creeds uh, on the table. So it's more complicated. Uh, and if we want to try, try to set those two dialogues in relations, I think the one of the points might be is the symbolic importance. The dialogue between the Constantinople and the uh, Tübingen uh, theologians has very high symbolic importance because it is being considered as the very first dialogue. And we had recently also event as uh, ecumenical patriarch uh, uh, came to Tübingen recently and uh, was awarded Dr. Honoris Kaiser title. And we had also event called Tübingen II. So this Tübingen uh, idea is still present as a point of reference. And it might be helpful for us to think uh, about the dialogue and try to have also a different point of reference. Would it change our understanding of dialogue if we would imagine the first uh, initial point as a point of uh, agreement and not a point of disagreement as it was the case in Tübingen. And I think it might uh, help us, I think, to keep both in mind. Uh, to have a bit more uh, complex understanding of interconfessional relations. Thank you. Uh, again, I, I, if we were here in person instead of virtually, I would ask you now to give an applause uh, for um, Dr. Stanislav Palau and his um, presentation of, of, again, breaking ground, um, joining others um, such as Thomas Hart, uh, such as George Fosfeg, and such as myself, who've been trying to find ways um, to raise this issue of this encounter and then explore the significance and appreciate his larger context uh, that I have found um, in how far this discussion has gone. 
We also want to thank our panelists, Dr. Timothy Winger, Dr. Solomon Bagene, Dr. Heller. Um, again, we want to thank all of our uh, sponsors. Um, we are grateful to the Institute for Classical Christian Studies, to Ecumenical Trends, to the Ecumenical Studies and Research um, a Center, um, to the McCoy Theological Seminary, to Georgetown University's Department of Theology and Religious Studies, and its Birth Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs, and then to the uh, organization that was the primary sponsor and mover uh, for this event, um, the Ecclesiological Investigations International Research Network. Um, that organization is the one um, that set the frame and Georgetown was gracious to be the host as well as co-sponsor. So we're grateful for all of them. Again, um, this is, will be, it has been recorded and it will be archived. Um, there will be a present, a summary uh, of this conversation will be in ecumenical trends. So the conversation continues. Uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you for the participants for participating and thank you for the Ecclesiological Investigations International Research Network for your sponsoring this event along with um, the Georgetown University Department of Theology, Religious Studies and its Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace and World Affairs. Uh, God bless you all. And we look forward to future events sponsored by the Ecclesiological Investigations International Research Network, as well as Georgetown's Berkeley uh, Center for Religion, Peace and World Affairs. Thank you all. God bless again.